Morning, everyone. Thank you very much for uh, joining me the, this morning. This is the morning market review. My name is Russell Shaw, Senior Market Specialist at FXM. And my email address is ashaw at fxm.com. I um, want to just encourage any emails if you need to contact me, send to that address, and I'll respond as soon as I can. Um, today is Thursday, and it is the 7th of April. I'm just coming up our high risk investment warning. I'll keep this on screen for a few moments. Okay, Michael, Howard, pleasure to have you guys on the webinar as always. And uh, there's a fair few people on, so thank you very much for joining this morning. Uh, very much appreciated. Uh, I'm going to um, bring up our market commentaries disclaimer here. Hey, Anna, good morning to you. Nice to have you on the webinar. And um, our references, Market Scope 2.0. Uh, we're going to do the CNBC morning note, and uh, we may use Trading View. Um, just to see uh, how the webinar progresses. And um, let's start off with the, uh, the morning note. Um, all right, so it reads, European markets set for cautious open hawkish Fed, Russian, uh, Russia sanctions in focus. All right, so European markets are set to pull back slightly on Thursday as the US Federal Reserve Monetary Tightening plans and the ongoing war in Ukraine continue to guard sentiment. The pan-European stock 600 index closed down by around 1.6% on Wednesday as hawkish comments, comments from two Fed policymakers heightened expectations that the central bank would embark on a more aggressive tightening process. Wall Street then sold off for a second consecutive day on Wednesday as uh, Fed meeting minutes show that officials plan to reduce their trillions in bond holdings by a consensus amount of around 95 billion. Um, I didn't actually, I was taking a look through the minutes this morning. Um, I wasn't quite, I can't see where that uh, number comes from. I'll, I'll take a look at the minutes again, but they are very hawkish, there's no doubt about it. Uh, meanwhile, policymakers indicated that one or more 50 basis point interest rate hikes could be warranted, warranted to battle surging inflation. Um, US stock futures pointed lower in early pre-market trade on Thursday, while shares in Asia Pacific also fell, with Japan's Nikkei 225 shedding almost 2% to lead losses. Investors worldwide are also keeping an eye on the fallout from China's tight COVID-19 controls as it battles another surge in cases, potentially further disrupting global supply chains. They're also awaiting details of a new round of Western sanctions against Russia after evidence emerged of potential war crimes in Ukraine. NATO foreign ministers gathered in Brussels on Wednesday for a two-day meeting to address Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the, internationals and the international body's response. In corporate news, Credit Suisse republished historical financial results on Thursday morning to reflect its new divisional reporting structure that it wasn't that was announced in November. All right. Um, I think let's just start off with the Fed minutes. They were uh, fairly aggressive. Um, I think that uh, Brainard's comments, a Lael Brainard made a um, spoke on Monday. Um, uh, the San Francisco President Daly spoke on uh, Monday, um, did I say Wednesday? Like, oh, oh, Monday. Um, the idea here is that they are um, indicating, obviously, hawkishness. Brainard, in particular, uh, captured the um, the market's attention uh, because number one, she's a dove. Okay, well, she was always regarded as a dove. The Second reason is because she um, indicated that um, there's going to be aggressive uh, quantitative tightening. Um, and then the minutes suggest that the QT can start um, probably um, come May, which is about two months earlier than market expectations. So the idea here is the um, uh, the Fed is uh, hawkish. Um, so Howard says he's found the Stan Weinstein book, and he's asking about bonds. So yeah, 
let's let's address that in a in a in a in a moment. Um, the actually probably worth uh, probably worth talking about those now. Now, Howard, um, let's um, let's talk about bonds. All right. So I am going to bring up my um, my trading view. And, but, and, and he's always and he's also referencing Bitcoin, so we can take a look at uh, at Bitcoin for sure. All right, so let's just bring this guy up here. All right, so this is the tenure underneath. This is the Nasdaq. Um, let's actually bring up. I'm going to bring up. Uh, I'll I'll leave the tenure at the bottom, uh, which is the yields. So let's bring up what's called IEF. IEF, uh, which is a ETF for uh, treasury bonds. So here we're looking at the prices of 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 treasuries. Um, it's interesting that they're calling this a treasury bond. ETF uh, bond generally um, anything up to ten years is actually a note. <laughs> Strictly speaking, anything after ten years is a bond. Um, all right, let's take a look here. Okay, so um, take a look at this, um, Howard. Um, we've got to go back even further here. Let's put in uh, just in five years to see what we get here. All right. Now, isn't this amazing? Just take a look at this in terms of a, uh, a mirror reflection. Uh, let's put in a let's put in a neckline there. Let's put a neckline in there. And um, let's put in our so left shoulder head, right shoulder. That looks correct to me. Uh, let's put in here left shoulder uh, head. head and uh, let's just put in the right shoulder uh, and it's just asking what's line at the bottom I'm, I'm going to show you that in a moment Okay, cool. So uh, Anna just asking, what is this instrument? So let's just bring it up. And you can see Anna, we're looking at the 10-year yield, US 10-year yield. Do you see that? Okay, so we've got the 10-year yield. So we'd be looking at interest rates. Okay, we're looking at, at rates. Um, so that's the bottom. The second, the, the first one, we're looking at the price. We're looking at price. So uh, you can see there's an inverse relationship between the price of bonds and the Yield. That's what what we want to um, highlight here. Um, we can also um, do this via formula. Uh, it's not the best way to do it, so it's not the most correct way, but it will make the point. Uh, so we'll calculate something called the running yield. And the way the running yield works is as follows: uh, when you buy when you buy a bond, you are entitled to what's called a coupon payment. You usually. Usually it's twice a year, I believe. So let's just say the coupon here is uh, $10. And the coupon generally is a fixed amount. Uh, and what we can do is we can divide the uh, the coupon by the price of the bond. Let's say the price of the bond is 100 bucks. Okay, so what is, the inter what is your interest rate here? What is your running yield? Well, your running yield here is 10%. Okay, $10 uh, divided by 100, uh, 10%. Now, so your coupon, your coupon equals 10%, and your yield, and your yield, they're two different things, and your yield equals 10%. What's the difference? The coupon um, is your, how much you, um, the, uh, the agreement is that they'll pay you, so they'll say, so right at the beginning of your, 
when you purchase into a bond on issue, you're buying uh, a, um, a promise effectively of paying your coupon. Um, when the uh, price is, uh, when the price that it's trading at, so, uh, when the price the uh, note of a bond is trading at, equals to its what we call face value or par value, uh, then your coupon is going to equal your uh, yield. Now, let's assume that, uh, let's assume now that the yield's going to go up. Okay, so let's just say yield's going to go up to 20%. So coupon's going to be constant. So we're going to have, all right, $10. What's that? $10. That's your coupon over X. Okay, we don't know what the price is. What we're saying is that the what we're saying is that the yield is going to be 20%. Okay. So how do we get that 20%? Well, X must equal to X must equal 50 bucks, right? If my math is right. Okay. Uh, 10 divided by 50 should give us 20%. So just take a look at the relationship here. The bond price has gone from 100 to 50. Bond price has fallen. Okay. What's happened to the yield? In this case, what we call the running yield. Okay. It's jumped from 10% to 20%. So price comes down, yield moves up. You hear that? Price comes down, yield moves up. The inverse relationship. Price comes down, yield moves up. Okay, let's go to our. Here you can see the mirror. This, yeah, you see it in action. Price is at the top, it's come down, yields at the bottom, moved up. Price come down, yield moves up. Everybody with me? Everybody with me? So then the question is how it was. So what's going to happen to bonds? So we're talking about, so we're talking about um, an aggressive Fed. So we're expecting. So we're expecting, ah, now you got it, Howard. So we're expecting higher rates. If rates are going to move up, what do we expect bond prices to do? Value of bond should come down. Okay. Now, we won't get into the um, sort of the intricacies of um, if you're a bond investor or not. But what I will say is that it, it doesn't really matter if you're holding your bond to maturity. The, 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 you've, got the, you've got no price risk if you're holding the bond to maturity. You're just going to have to trust me on that. But if you are jobbing the, the bond market, if you're trading into and out of the bond market, then it makes a huge difference. And it's a huge difference um, what's happening with interest rates. So um, we'll just leave it at that for the time being. The point is, okay that it looks as if bond markets are set to come under pressure that's what it looks like okay just because of the inverse relationship of um yield to uh, to price okay so that's the first instrument we're looking at let's take a look at the dollar i think that looking at the dollar here is going to be instrumental as well let's bring up so i'm taking out ref let's keep the US 10 year in at the bottom. Let's take a look at the dollar. And also just remember that the prices don't move in a straight line. Hey, we're still going to see uh, rallies, peaks and troughs, peaks and troughs. So uh, just keep that in mind. We're never going to move in a straight line. All right, let's just bring up the uh, FXM US dollar index. Let's take a look here. Okay, and um, let's put in a, let's take the neckline out. I don't think we need this. All right. So here's kind of where the, the dollar bottoms. And then it really, um, it really starts taking off from here. Okay. Uh, on an absolute basis, we're just going to use this as on an absolute basis. Uh, okay. okay, so it seems that so there's a little bit of a, a dip here in yields. Uh, bond, um, dollar comes down, um, but then 
it starts moving up. And my uh, sort of my uh, um, thinking there is that the dollar the dollar market was anticipating the the strong movement in yield. Yields kind of caught up now. But I would also suggest that uh, this uh, this area here is probably quite important. This area here, and uh, I would actually move it a bit there. So I'd say that this area is quite important because that effectively stops the that effectively stops the dollar decline. Okay, so you kind of get the uh, the downwards momentum starting to to wane, so that the downwards pressure starting to weaken. Eventually, it stabilizes, and we get a and we get an up movement. And um, now uh, I think that um, you can see the dollar is uh, very much um, being supported by, by yield. And I think that makes sense. Um, if you want to um, invest in a, uh, a coupon, if you want to invest in a, in a, in a, in a, in a coupon um, in, in US dollars, you've got to pay, um, you've got to pay in greenback. So uh, you'll, make the, you'll have to buy dollars to make that payment. Um, so I think that's what's happening there. Okay, so the interest rate here seems to be supporting the dollar. That's that's really the important part for us. Is well, okay, dollar has been pushed up. What does that mean for us as as traders? Because I think that the the dollar really links the um, the, the monetary policy to where, to the space we um, are active in, um, which of course brings us to the um, to the Bitcoin. Let's let's take a look at Bitcoin because because how it brought it up. And um, let me go to BTC USD here. And yesterday we looked at Bitcoin, and Bitcoin is really doing well in in, in terms of the um, the technicals. We've got this high higher peak. Now, um, what we uh, suggested yesterday. Um, is that, um, and I also wrote an article, I think you can find it on Telegram, I think I posted it on Telegram, um, is that the movement up in Bitcoin, so higher trough, higher peak, one, so what I wrote in articles, one would be excused for thinking that that movement in Bitcoin is, um, you know, is incorrect, given how hawkish the the, the Fed is. Why do I say that? Because you've got the US dollar as the denominator here. You've got the US dollar as the denominator. So we've already seen that it looks as if the US dollar is going to be supported by interest rates. Interest rates very much a function of uh, how aggressive the uh, the Fed's trying to be. What I th but I think this is a really interesting chart. Okay, I think I think that this chart has become quite important. My feel has become quite important in this uh, economic environment, which is a potentially stagflationary environment. In other words, I think that we've got to take a look at how to see if this pullback. Here, why would there be a pullback here? Well, it's it's clearly because the central bank's being so hawkish, right? So the, that hawkishness pushing up the U.S. dollar. US dollars acting against the Bitcoin. Okay, so so this this over here seems to make sense. What would be interesting, okay, is if we get some sort of pattern like this. Okay, let's so if we get that, I'll put a question mark because we, I don't know if we're going to get that. But if we get a higher trough followed by a higher peak, then the Bitcoin continues to outperform the US dollar. So now that makes me think, well, how is that possible? How is that possible? If we've got such an aggressive Fed, okay, if, <laughs> Jan's asking if I've become a Bitcoin fan yet. Not, well, not quite, but let me try and explain myself. Let me try and explain myself. So the idea here is, um, if Bitcoin gets a higher trough, higher peak, my feel is that, um, it's telling us something. I think it's telling us something very important in terms of monetary policy, not in terms of Bitcoin intrinsic value. I think the actual signal that Bitcoin's giving us is on 
a monetary policy scale, which is quite a bizarre thing to say, but that's the way I'm looking at it. The idea here is, okay, the idea here is, I think that Bitcoin participants, if they continue to uh, chart a higher trough into a higher peak, I think the, the Bitcoin particip participants will be telling us that they just don't buy the Fed story that they are going to be as aggressive as they're signaling. So yes, we've got the we've got the Fed minutes. Yes, we've got Brainard on record. Today we're actually getting Bullard. Bullard has also he was a dissenter. He was also a dove, but now he's the most hawkish of all of them. He wanted a 50 basis point hike last month. He he's speaking at a at a at a at a um, event that's been organised by the University of Missouri. I think it's Missouri, I believe. The point is, once he talks, uh, he's probably going to push the yields up even higher. Perhaps we see dollar move higher. Perhaps we see Bitcoin come under further pressure. But the question that I pose, and I don't have an answer for this, by the way, because it's it's the million dollar question, is how capable is the Fed of being hawkish? What kind of a capacity do they have to embark on a huge quantitative tightening cycle? Okay, do they have? The, do they really have um, this type of, a, of an ability? And I'm not so sure they do. Now, the reason that I don't think they do is uh, they're going to do uh, if they go ahead with such an aggressive tightening. They are basically banking on the strong labour market to make um, the ramifications as soft as possible. So th there's a real risk of recession here. They're hoping that the strong labor market makes that sort of recession as easy as possible or possibly sort of sidestep the recession altogether. That's a big gamble, I reckon. If you're talking about a market that is hugely reliant on liquidity, and we've been saying this since we've started these webinars is that the, the market is just an, an addict. It's a liquidity addict. And we saw that even before um, the um, QE into um, COVID, before that, the sort of the, the fourth quarter of 2019 was heavily loaded in terms of liquidity. I don't know if you guys remember that. So what I'm thinking is that this Bitcoin chart and gold have become really important charts for us to monitor in terms of what kind of capacity does uh, the, the Fed really have. Now, gold is, um, well, it's just moving sideways, but I would suggest that if gold does start moving higher, if Bitcoin does start moving higher, you're probably going to have to see the Fed dialing back on its aggressiveness. Now, that's just so they, they're playing a high stakes game here because they've already lost credibility. Okay? So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very interesting part of economic history that we're witnessing right now. We're just going to have to see how it plays out. Um, so I hope that answers your question, Jan. Am I a Bitcoin fan? Uh, well, the next question is Anne is asking, have I bought one? And, and, and the answer to that is no, I, I haven't. <laughs> Um, all right. Uh, the 20 moving averages crossed on the daily, uh, which may signal, I don't know if it's signaling a downturn per se, Howard. We could be in a pullback period. Uh, there certainly is, they're talking, so what the Fed officials now are doing, what they're effectively doing is they're preparing the market for a 50 basis point hike in May and uh, a likely 50 basis point hike in um in june so i think we're going to get um, a full percentage point over two over two months i think that's what the, and then after that maybe maybe the market um sees that they don't have the capacity to do this uh, and again I, I, this is just something that um, i'm posing i don't know um i just think that there is a real recessionary risk here that is perhaps being underestimated. That's that's my feel. Um, and, and by the way, these um, we're going to look at some ch other charts now. And is saying, all right. So I'm not so I'm not sure what a Bitcoin maximalist is, but she she's quoting a Bitcoin maximalist. 
that the Fed can't keep up, can't keep, uh, can't keep up with its raising rates. I think that's what you said there, Anna. And, and that's basically what I'm saying. I'm saying that that's what the Bitcoin uh, market seems to be suggesting, that the Fed, a uh, maximalist, <laughs> okay, uh, maximalist is a Bitcoin believer. So, um, so I think the Bitcoin chart actually has shifted from a, a, a truly speculative instrument. And I, I'm not saying that it's perhaps not speculative. I'm not saying maybe it is, maybe it isn't. I, and yeah, I've got to get my head around it. So I, I could be behind the curve there. But um, I actually think the Bitcoin has become a, a, a serious contender for being an economic indicator. How, how's that for a statement? You know, so um, we'll just have to... Uh, to watch that. Um, let's just go through to some, some charts here. So I had NASDAQ up. So I just want to go back to NASDAQ. Um, and the NASDAQ chart here is very interesting because it's got a, a pullback through to its 62% um, retracement. Now, FIBS, FIBS, again, I don't, Personally, I don't think there's any magic in the Fibonacci uh, number sequence. Um, you know, I think that uh, you can mine data until you find whatever you want. But the, the truth of the matter is um, the 62% is a very closely looked at um, pullback. And if it's a, um, if it's a closely looked at um, um, metric, then it's probably a self-fulfilling prophecy. So, we see a pullback all the way through to this 62% uh, um, area. Uh, it hits it right um, at the high, and now it looks as if it could be pulling back. Now, this is dangerous. Okay, so we're in a very dangerous situation here. Okay, we've got this one, two, two, three, and this two, three, that's what I, we've been talking about this now for a couple of weeks. This is really worrying. What is this two, three? Um, is it a is it um, is it a value type of proposition, or is this actually a a bear market rally? And if it's a bear market rally, well, we haven't even seen the pain yet because that means we're going to take out number two, okay? And it doesn't have to move like that. It could kind of move something like this, something like this, something like that. You know, it could take. So, but the point is this. 62% retracement on NASDAQ is, um, is very, very uh, nerve-wracking indeed. I, I did show you yesterday on the DAX, we get this type of a pattern. I think that would be much more comfortable for, for all of us. But this 62% retracement, okay, I think is um, actually reflecting fundamentals, okay? I think that is the fundamentals being reflected here. What am I talking about? Okay, what am I talking about? And I think that it comes right back to the time value of money, which we've introduced to the analysis over the, the last year, because I really think that's what it's all about. NASDAQ is a growth index. NASDAQ is a growth index. That means that the growth companies don't dish out dividends. They retain them. They reinvest them until they reach some sort of mature stage. And then they would pay out a dividend. In other words, the chances of you receiving a dividend from a growth company in the short term are remote. It's not a bad thing. That is just the way growth companies operate. They need that money to grow. So if the payout is way in the future, they're going to get absolutely smashed. They're going to get absolutely smashed by higher interest rates. And uh, that's why I think the 62% here is actually, so we're getting kind of this, we often talk about a confluence of resistance. Well, we're actually getting a confluence of resistance with fundamentals here. And um, that's quite, quite nerve-wracking because if the Fed continues to talk up interest rates, well then, I think this could then we I think this could really be a strong contender for a bear market rally until proven otherwise. So, um, and how would I say, when we say when I say proven otherwise, I would say something like that. But the more pressure the Fed puts on interest rates, the greater the danger that um, growth stocks capitulate. And um, uh, at least in the sort of 
uh, near term um, as they start uh, discounting the, the prospects of that. Um, so I want to just keep an eye on that. Um, let's just bring up the um, let's bring up the DAX. Um, what is the what are the key indicators of a recession? Um, so um, let me give that some thought. You know, it's obviously a, a, a really good question. Um, so uh, let's just take a look at at, at um, DAX also at the 62%. Um, not quite as being uh, hurt as NASDAQ. So we've got a little bit of uncertainty here, some sort of, sort of spinning top. We go through to NASDAQ. Um, a little bit heavier on the downside. We'll just have to see. Um, let's just bring up US 30 as well. Okay. Um, let's bring in a FIB. So the, the Dow, by the way, the Dow Jones, that's more mature. So I, I don't think these guys get hit as badly as the as the uh, the growth stocks, but nevertheless, uh, you can still see that the talk up in interest rates on that 62% is uh, is hit, hitting them quite uh, quite hard. All right. So Jan's asking, what are the key indicators of a recession? Um, well, I think first and foremost, Dan, we probably need to look at the PMIs, right? So um, let me see if I can find some PMIs. They weren't on the they weren't on the um, reference slide, but I'm just going to go to uh, trading economics, okay? And we'll see what the um, the PMIs are telling us, okay? So what is what is the PMIs? It's basically the um, pr uh, producer or production managers index. It's really a frontline survey. It's generally um, probably more more sort of um, or initially it was used on the manufacturing side of the economy. Um, there is a there is a services um, PMI as well, and it's basically a survey that gets sent out by ISM, and, and the survey kind of gets a sentiment. So it's frontline data. So uh, let's see if we can find a, a PMI here. Mm, there might be an issue. I seem to recall that uh, the one that we want is the ISM. And I seem to recall that it's sort of hidden in this um, in trading economics. Let's just see if we can find it. I don't think this is the ISM. Uh, I don't think this is the ISM one. Let's just take a look. Uh, let's get a, a five-year here. So, okay, here it goes into COVID. Okay, you can see the big dip down into COVID. It recovers. Uh, PMI has been coming down. It has been moving up. I'm going to suggest that this is not the one that we want to be looking at. We probably want to be looking at the ISM. So I think that um, in terms of recession, well, clearly if our PMRs go under 50, um, that, that's bad news. It means there's contraction there. There's contraction there. Okay. Um, is one in indicate two quarters of shrinking GDP? Yeah, so two, so that defines what we call a technical recession. If you get uh, two quarters of uh, negative GDP, uh, not shrinking, ne negative GDP. Okay, so two quarters of negative GDP would be a recession. Um, all right, so that's just one of the, that's just one of these, um, of course, in a recession, yeah, and you'd also see um, your unemployment rate uh, moving up as Kerber says, you, you'd also start seeing your GDP coming down. Um, and if you get negative GDP, that uh, especially two, as he says, two quarters in a row, that's a technical recession. Um, and um, we'll have to, I think, uh, prepare a, a, a webinar on this. So what, the way that a, an economist would probably look at it, they'll take a look at what's called leading indicators, uh, coincident and lagging indicators, and work those all into kind of getting a, um, a picture I just need to do a little bit of prep work uh, just to bring up uh, what we can look at for leading, what we can look at for coincidence, what we could look at for lagging. So 
I know that the unemployment rate is considered lagging. The non-farm payrolls is considered coincident. Um, inventory levels, I believe, is um, a leading indicator, but subject to correction there. Um, all right. Um, I think I think that's probably where we, we uh, where we can stop for today. Um, are there any? Let's maybe just take a look at the decks um, a little bit closer to the price action. See what's happening. But if there's a, if there's any questions, uh, just go ahead and um, type those in. All right. So um, let's just bring this up there. So you can see here, this is the problem on the, on the daily here. You can see that we've dropped out of this um, zone one. We now are sort of in zone two, and we um, under pressure in terms of moving into zone three. That's not a uh, that's not such a comfortable position to be in. And um, if we have to talk about well, where's the momentum? Well, the momentum's actually slipping. It's moved from zone one into zone two, so from strength to neutral is actually a step backwards. If we go through to the hourly, well, you can see that the central pivot is starting to act like a, um, a resistance here. So if we get a if we get a rollover of the EMAs and the stochastic heads back down to sort of the negative twenty, uh, that would be um, that wouldn't be good in terms of our zone analysis. Um, all right, uh, how is just asking us to take a look at US dollar Japanese yen? Yeah, we certainly can. Let's just bring that up. So it's really been strong. Um, I actually think um, you know, Pete asked us about it um, last week. Mm. So it's overbought. Let's just take a look at this on a daily. So I think when we looked at it last uh, last week or, or, or two weeks ago, it was very um, overbought. Um, it's now sort of cleared that on the daily. Uh, weekly, um, perhaps a little overbought. However, again, um, the underlying fundamentals have seemed to suggest that the US dollar should outperform the Japanese yen. Why? It's because the Fed is so hawkish and the Bank of Japan is dovish. There's just a huge um, divergence between the two central banks. So one would, one would think that over time, uh, US dollar would appreciate against the, the Japanese yen. I'm not sure even if the, uh, I'm not sure if the, um, Japanese would mind that um, because they're an export nation. Um, we'll just have to keep an eye on it. Japanese yen is a is a um, is a haven of sorts. Uh, so I guess it makes the US dollar Japanese yen quite an interesting um, pair in of itself. But you can see that since the hostilities began, a lot of money um, has pushed. Uh, into the US dollar um, from the Japanese yen. So it just seems that's the direction. That seems to be the path of least resistance for now. Um, and is asking, what about the London Open uh, and US market? Uh, no, we only have the one, the one webinar uh, at the moment. So my focus has really sort of shifted to written content at the moment. So, but we, we will, of course, do um, this which we don't call the DAX open anymore. So this is kind of the morning market review. And then we will do the crypto minute every every Wednesday. All right. Um, any other questions there? All righty. So you've got my email. Um, let's wrap up here. Wish every, every one of you a very good day ahead. And uh, we'll chat um, tomorrow morning. Thank you very much, guys.